All right, so our next presenter is going to be Coach Tyler Ayers. He's in his third stint here with Weber International University. He's the head strength and conditioning coach at Weber. Coach Ayers works directly with football and softball while overseeing all sports and the intern and mentorship program here. He is a 2014 graduate from Anderson University with a degree in exercise science. He's a former WIU strength and conditioning alum, having completed the intern assistant um, position here in 2014 through 15 and a year as an assistant strength and conditioning coach here in 2015 through the year 16. So following the first two years at Weber, Coach Eric became the first ever athletic performance coach at Lawrence University in Wisconsin. <laughs> he has completed internships with Anderson University, Bethune Cookman, Stetson University, including being named interim head strength and conditioning coach for the Hatters. Coach Eric is certified uh, as a certified strength and conditioning specialist by the NCA and a strength and conditioning coach certified through the uh, CSCCA, as well as an approved mentor, um, and as well as um, level one certified through USAW. So without further ado, uh, Coach Harris. Thanks, Mark. I'm sure everybody's kind of tired of seeing my face up here by now, but we'll go a little bit longer. So um, first things first, as we get going, I have to throw out some thank yous. Uh, without a doubt, the first one there, Coach Rad, is this would not be possible today uh, without his doing. We started this seven years ago, or he started this seven years ago now. Um, I've seen it grow from five people up to 40-ish around there today. Uh, hit and miss some couple years uh, back, but it's been a nice little change of pace uh, we've had here. So uh, he's played a huge role in my life as well. Uh, part of our mentorship process here is very deep and very involved. We like to go deeper than the surface level, deeper than just being the coach. Uh, it involves a lot of uh, personal things too. So I can definitely thank him for that. Uh, Darren Ritchie was top of mind in here earlier, our athletic director, um, getting the opportunity to come back here. I was named uh, the assistant head strength coach here for a while, or associate head strength coach, sorry. Um, it was kind of a new position, so it kind of almost created a position for me to come back, which is nice. Um, Kristen Avery up at Lawrence, uh, again, kind of the first ever uh, athletic performance coach there. So they invested time and money into me to go up there and spend some time with them. Uh, Coach Medgar Harrison was at Bethune Cookman University for a long time, and that's where I interned at. Kind of got my first feet, uh, feet wet, so to speak, uh, in strength and conditioning with him. Uh, getting the opportunity to coach, which was actually awesome, being an intern. Glenn Bricky at Stetson, the director of sports med. Again, I'll talk into that a little bit later um, when, I, when I discuss my time there. Coach Wallace of Florida Southern, kind of excited to make it here today, but I got his, uh, his stand in and Dr. Allen, so uh, it's almost a close second. Uh, our current Weber strength staff, again, I'll show you a little bit later too, it's kind of been uh, ever changing, ever evolving this year. We've had a rotating door of guys coming in and leaving. Um, it's kind of been unique, and it's been a little bit of a test of my own abilities to hire. Uh, our former Weber strength staff, uh, again, too, I've been through this process now for quite some time. We got some of those people in the room today. Uh, Coach Josh Connor, Coach Steve McPherson, okay? Appreciate you guys being here. Our Weber ATs, and also other young drug professionals the field, and lastly you. Again, you're here still, so that's a, a testament to your uh, due diligence and willing to continue to grow and be a part of this. So my journey, as Mark mentioned a little bit, uh, I started at Anderson University. I played football there, did my exercise science undergrad there, had my in coaching and nutrition. Kind of got my start there. I interned with our football department uh, after I finished playing. So I finished, I'm like, what am I gonna do now? I have an exercise science degree, uh, I'm going to either be a football coach or I'm going to be a strength coach. Which am I going to do? So I started out with him, uh, and there was no strength coach. It was football staff running things. We were in the same program on Monday and Thursday, and the same program on Tuesdays and Fridays. And I'm like, I wonder why I never got strong the whole time I was there. Uh, then my time I left there, went to Bethune Cookman University, like I mentioned before. Uh, I up working under Coach Medgar Harrison. Really great opportunity for me. And then I decided to take the journey here uh, to Weber. I'll tell you how I got there just a little bit because it's going to tie into the presentation today. Uh, my time at Stetson as well, very unique opportunity before I came back again to Weber for a second time. And then my trip to Lawrence uh, before I came back to Weber for a third time. So it's kind of all in, uh, ties in and it's kind of unique, but it'll explain it all and it kind of explain how it makes sense and why I think it's important uh, to maximize your time in the field uh, with what you do. So to start out with, we got to look at a couple definitions. Uh, maximization, so I got this off the internet. Uh, to increase to the greatest possible amount or degree. I think we all agree upon that as maximization. That kind of entails what it means. To represent the highest possible estimate or magnify. But the one we're going to look at today is going to be to make the greatest or fullest use of. I think this is the biggest one that's going to hit home for us. 
um, as we try to discuss and evaluate um, how we can spend our time in the field and make the most of it. Some opportunities, okay? Opportunities are like sunrises or sunsets. You can change it however you want to in there. If you wait too long, you miss them, all right? So there's gonna be opportunities that come in front of you along the way in your journey, and how you interpret those things and how you weigh them out are gonna be important and probably gonna play a role into what direction that your coaching career goes, or whichever role, or whichever uh, career you are in right now, whether it's AT, sports med side of things, maybe uh, ex fit side of things, that's gonna play a role in, in the direction that you go for your career. So let's look at the field of strength conditioning. Okay, it's very specific. You're looking at a minimum of two to four internships probably. Just a general estimate there. During those internships, as you try to break into the field, you're gonna spend at least probably 20 hours or more per week during that internship, okay? You put those two things together, and then you look over here and see all the fun that we're having, all right? <laughs> so there's a lot of time being invested uh, for something that's probably not going to be the best thing when you're trying to find a job because you're going to be applying for jobs in an oversaturated market. Okay? Those of you who have been in strength conditioning for a long time, those of you who are my GAs who are looking to get a new job, you completely understand uh, the competitive level there is for finding a job in strength and conditioning right now. There's jobs popping up at the high school level, but the collegiate level right now, there's not a lot of jobs popping up. And at that at point being as well, if there are jobs popping up, Here's a rough estimate we can look at um, when we go to apply for an entry-level job in the collegiate level. Down towards the 10,000 up to 25,000, right? That's entry-level type stuff, no matter what level it is. I've seen a job posted at Division I school that that was the number. And you have guys leaving from other schools to go chase that. So it's important to understand that maximization of your time, your effort is a must. You have to maximize your time in this field if you're going to pursue a, a full career out of it. I've heard it said over and over again, there's very few people that retire as strength coaches because there's a lot of time and effort being spent or they're spinning their wheels a lot, okay? And it's not always gonna be the best thing, but you have to maximize your time while you're in it. So let's dive into a little bit deeper here. This is gonna be a little soapbox. Um, we attended the 2019 NSCA College Coaches Conference up in Indy. Uh, the NSCA conducted a survey salary this past year with collegiate coaches specifically, okay? I went to that, it was on a Saturday morning maybe, or whichever morning it was, it was a morning session, okay? And I walk in and there's 20 of us in the room. But yet how many of us on social media or somewhere else are worried about what we're making, but yet nobody has the wherewithal to even show up, okay, to when they actually have a presentation and they actually describe what it looks like for our profession. It was kind of embarrassing to walk in and see that. But what I get out of it, okay? Well, five years or less of experience, okay, you're looking at a rough estimate here. Again, this is kind of our average of $32,000 uh, with less than five years of experience. So this is just uh, trying to show you why you have to maximize your time. Florida Collegiate Coaches, we're incorporating NAIA, D3, D2, uh, Division I, your Power Fives. This is all incorporated here, so don't think, you know, I'm a collegiate coach in Florida, this is what I'm be, be making because I can promise you that there's plenty of people in here that probably don't make that, including myself, okay? So with that being said, though, there's an asterisk, though, here, mainly because, though, out of the top, out of the 50 states they actually analyzed, and they used college coaches from each of those states, I think four or five of the states didn't qualify. They didn't have enough data uh, to actually run the numbers and get a, a good estimate on that. So, but the asterisk is there, though, because we were in the bottom five of the actual eligible uh, states that they looked at as a whole. So it's kind of interesting to look at that. They also uh, showed how many degrees were obtained and at what level. So 38% uh, had a minimum of a bachelor's degree, 57% had an uh, elevated degree of a master's degree, which is actually, when you put them both together, you're looking at 90, uh, with a 95% have at least a, an elevated degree. So if you want to get your foot in the door with strength and conditioning, you have to be able to probably have an associate's degree and just kind of run your way through it. But everybody wants to have that box checked, right? I don't see the box check no matter what. And then there's the last one here again, which kind of plays into uh, how many athletes on average that those coaches work with on a daily basis, okay? Or had to, or in charge of, in charge of about 177. So you're looking at, again, probably like a D2, D3, having a solo coach or having basically one or two people there on staff to make this thing happen. Because that's a lot of athletes to work with. And so you have to understand why this ties back into what's being made, all right? So, need for maximization too, as well, a little further. All right, so we take our 
average work week, okay, those of you that have been doing internships or things like that, you may not understand, that's kind of rough estimate, maybe. 60 plus or minus five hours, maybe. Um, it's, again, it's not a nine to five, okay. Those of you that have been in, this, in the collegiate route at least, you understand that's probably not the case, and you're gonna be close to that 60. Um, so you take that, of our less than five years in the field, divide it out by our weeks, get it down to our actual weeks, or our hours worked per week, and now you're looking at about 1045. I won't get me wrong here, okay, as we do a comparison, all right, because there's plenty of great people in these jobs that are, are popping up. But I would say, though, this, you know, you can go be a guard man and work this. This is our national estimate, uh, our national average of what's being made across different levels of, of, of um, jobs across the country. And so that's a small thing there. I mean, there's, there's perks to each of these jobs. You know, it's probably more of a uh, sometimes seven to three or something like that. You made a great team by being a landscaper. Okay, but there's some different things there, though, that you can do to probably change or at least enjoy your life a little bit more uh, than what you would be doing at this for 60 hours a week. So why should you listen to me? Well, I'm only 26 years old, been in the field five years or so. That's great, but I think I've experienced a couple things along the way that I think will help those of you that are coming into the field or those of you that have been in the field maybe for a while, you may be able to agree to some of these. So while it is wise to learn from experience, it is wiser to learn from the experience of others, whether good or bad, okay? I'm gonna show some things here eventually that, you know, here's what I took away from my, my experiences there, or here's what I took away from my job there, uh, good and bad side of things. So I think it's gonna be a little bit of an interesting take today um, on my presentation, but we'll get there. So like I mentioned before, but Phil Cookman University, there in Daytona Beach, Florida, my hometown, kind of easy to get a job there, being an intern, started there. You see the weight room here, it started out as just a volunteer intern, okay? It's putting in those times. So it's putting in probably closer to 35 to 40 hours at least a week um, with them. I think it's important to understand the team that I worked with, okay? Because eventually, at some point too, you're gonna wanna have experience in a certain amount of teams because you're gonna go apply for a job at some point and they're gonna have a specific team you may need to work with or teams you may need to work with and showing experience with those is important. So I tell our interns and our GAs all the time too, be exposed to as many teams as you can, whether you're in charge of them or whether you're working with them as, a, as an assistant. And like I said before, my first real experience. So what did I gain from my time at, at the Flynn Cookman? Well, I learned how to coach. That's one of the biggest things I think I took away during my time there. Coach Megan Harrison allowed me to coach. There are many Division I internships. Coach Drew Strady can attest to this. He was at a Division I internship where he was one of 20. And he had to do all the grunt work. There's parts of that that's, a, that's part of being an intern or a volunteer intern, but there's parts of it too where they're not being mentored, okay? And I had the ability to coach, whereas a lot of times too, you go somewhere, you're the setup and teardown guy, you're the muscle milk guy, you're the get the uh, protein guy, that's all you are. So I had the opportunity to coach about eight athletes per, uh, I had two racks basically, so I had about eight athletes or 10 athletes on the day I was able to work with, and it got my first exposure to be able to coach. I also learned the importance of relationships between myself and players, of gaining their trust, between other coaches, ATs, different people that I came in contact with, and how it would further my development as a coach and also my career uh, to find those niches, okay, or those opportunities for me to jump into for either a job or a, a kind of a, a specificity, okay, that I could go into later. The buy-in kind of ties into that, so the buy-in portion of it, again, I gain the knowledge and trust of my athletes, I have the ability to coach them up. They're bought into what I say now, okay? Maybe not always, but they're gonna be bought into some extent of what I say or how I'm coaching them, and that's huge. If you have no buy-in from your athletes, your client, your, your team, you're gonna to struggle to get them to do what you ask them to do. And so you have to have the buy-in factor, which goes back to your relationships. And to hit the, home, or hit the point home further, Okay? Forget yourself and relate to the athlete. It's not about me. Okay? When I got the strength and conditioning, it's not uh, I want my name to be or my, my picture to be plastered on some wall somewhere. I'm going to be a power five guy. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be the face of the program. How many times do you see that nowadays? You hear about strength coaches here and there for good or for bad, but that's all you think about when you think about that football program or you think about that college or university. That wasn't for me. Uh, but I wanted to go to relate to the athletes. So those of you that know about about the Bill Cookman University, okay, it's an HBCU school. Those of you who've seen me today, I'm not African American, okay? But I had to learn real quick that there are gonna be similarities that I have to be able to get across, across cultures, religious views, uh, races, 
things like that, that I have to be able to connect with an athlete. And I've learned that the first day I got there, you know? So we're gonna talk a little about my now my opportunities uh, for good or for worse um, that actually came a, a, a part of that. So I was able enough to, I was lucky enough, or maybe I did a good job of being able to be offered the GA position there. So they had finished up the summer internship, got offered the GA position, could have stayed on, I actually turned it down. And I turned it down though, because they had an opportunity to go work for Coach Mack up at Eastern Michigan. It was a nine month internship at the time, uh, no financial stability or no financial ability for them to help me out though, so it was on my own dime. Um, and I had the opportunity to go with them. So I turned down the GA position at Bethune Cookman, mainly, okay, so I could go for this on the left hand side, okay? Give a Coach Mack, get the, the, the major D1 experience, quote unquote, and also grow the network. Those of you in the field of collegiate strength and conditioning, no, it's not a matter of what cert you have, or you, you know, what you do, or who you work with. It's basically who you know and who you have a good relationship with. So I thought, man, this is it right here. I'm gonna go do this. Uh, this is my end all be all. We're gonna get into Eastern Michigan. I'm gonna make it big, and it's gonna be awesome. Because I turned down staying at home. Uh, you know, I could build upon the summer experience I had with them, uh, but I also had limited development there. And I saw this development that they were running up there. I'm like, oh, that's it. I gotta go. I gotta go. Uh, but eventually. What had happened was uh, I wasn't able to make it financially. So my parents said, hey, you know what? You're gonna go do this and you're gonna do it on your own. So I spent like two months and they had the job already at Eastern Michigan for them for an internship through Coach Fred Hale, went with him for, uh, on the phone back and forth a little bit, uh, trying to make it happen, things fell through. Now it's in July and July in the collegiate realm is, well, people have already signed, they're already going places and you may not have somewhere to go. So I'm like, what am I gonna do now? Well, that actually turned into being the best thing ever for me because at that point in time, Coach Steve Rassel posted a position here at Weber International, and I see on a football scoop, and I'm like, Weber International, I've never really heard of it. Uh, I know it's in Florida, I think, it says it's in Florida, um, but uh, you know, what's worse than that? I guess I can apply for it. Um, so it ended up being the best decision in my coaching career, uh, and you'll see some things why, but uh, it's definitely one of the unique situations that played out. So that led me to Weber. And that was also the first time around. So that's the old school logo. That was actually the logo being used when I first got here. Um, so that's kind of why it's up there. I got involved with the following teams here. I'm in charge of both softball, beach volleyball, bowling, and we all assisted with football. Uh, so you see here too, these were the girls I was in charge of with softball, uh, showing off the guns. I think that's one of the things I did a good job with and I still continue to do a decent job with, I hope, is getting the athletes to buy into what I'm, I'm giving them uh, from our programming standpoint and also working with me. Uh, so also the looks a little bit different. We've done some facelifting since then uh, on the way too. But what did I gain this time through though? I gained a lot of mentoring from Coach Raz. Like I previously mentioned already, our mentorship here is, is nationally recognized by an SCA. We do a good enough job and produce enough things uh, for our, our people that go through it, either volunteer interns, intern assistants, or GAs, to where they know what they're doing to get uh, enough in the field and, and be able to land a next job and, and, and move in the right direction. And I think those are people that have come through our program can actually attest to that. And so yeah, I, I became, you should have seen me day one. For, you should have seen Josh Connor day one when he showed up here two years ago to where he is now, wearing a different colored shirt across the lake. All right, so he's gained a lot of things along the way, just like I did during my first time here. We also learned how to program design. So we're not a big school, right? And not at the places you go, it's not gonna be major division one. You're not gonna have a speed coach. You're not gonna have just the exercise physiologist guy. You're not going to have just the nutritionist. You're not just going to have the strength coach. You're going to play all those roles most times you, uh, places you go. Um, and so it's important to be able to understand how to build a program, uh, the, the hows, the whys, the X's and O's, similar to what Mark gave us earlier um, through his uh, interpretation. I was going to learn and meet with sport coaches and ATs. Uh, this was the first time where I was the guy in charge. Uh, there was no middle person. It was just me. Coach Raz wasn't going to fight battles with the sport coach of the ATs, it was me stepping into that. Um, and that gave you very quickly, you learned how to either manipulate people in a good or bad way, okay? Because you had to get a point across, you know, if they don't want you in the weight room, why do we need to be in the weight room? Here's why we need to be in there, that, 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 right? All the way across and down the board. I also gave my coach an identity too. Um, nothing says, hey, you're in charge now, you gotta learn how to coach and you're gonna find out who you are. Because there's one day you come in the weight room with your athletes, they're gonna see you one way, the next day you come in and say you had a bad day, and you come in slouch and grouchy and whatever, and the athletes call you out right away, right? Because they saw you be a different way the day before. 
Okay, so you have to be able to know who you are as a coach and be able to either replicate it or live it out on a daily basis. And then also learn how what the grind okay, was all about. All right, there is a sense of grind in this field. Early mornings, late nights, whatever it is, that's part of it. During my time here, the first time it was we were in, in the weight room and we were in charge of the facility. We got paid hourly. That was our stipend back then. So my GA then turned to being a paid double. All right, that was just our stipend back then. Um, so we had, a, you know, we were uh, early morning football lift at 5.30 a.m. Sometimes they're closing the weight room down at 10 p.m., turn it back around again to be right back up again the next morning. Uh, so I was exposed to that very early. If you've never been exposed to that, either in the internship or in your future job or whatever it may be, that's something you need to be exposed to. There's good times, there's great times, there's bad times and low times in this field. Uh, but in the day, you have to learn how to manage all of those. So I left there uh, at the end of that year, finished up my internship, left, went to Stetson. So Stetson, over in the land, uh, east coast of Florida almost, or almost to Daytona, so getting close to home uh, for me. And I was able to become an intern there. So very unique situation, and I'll explain why when I step into it. Uh, but the teams I was responsible with and worked with, uh, both basketball programs, women's soccer, football, and a couple other uh, sports that were there. Now it's important to understand here that with basketballs, I basically had all the team was there. So we had the returners, we had the newcomers, the freshmen, uh, there's summer A and B terms that run in most Division I schools. Uh, this was happening there. And then women's soccer, we had about three to five kind of devoted girls that were in on an everyday basis going through it. Um, and I tell you that because I think mean, it's important um, because it helped and, and kind of molded my journey as a coach to where I'm here today. Because week one, I get there, okay? Working with a coach, day two happens. Hey, I gotta go to this meeting, okay. I'm this 22 year old guy, I've got one internship uh, through Weber, another internship through Bethune Cookman, I got this. Hey, I'm going to this meeting, okay, just hold down the weight room, help when the bell comes in. Uh, it'll be a quick meeting, but it's with the AD and somebody else, so, all right. He comes back about 30, 30, 45 minutes later with a security officer, the AD, somebody else, and he was basically asked to resign. So day two happens, packs his stuff, leaves. I'm like, all right. My internship. <laughs> Guess I'm not getting those uh, SCCC hours I needed, those 640 hours I needed, because he was one of the guys. Uh, and then, mind you, day five, that Friday, the assistant coach was leaving. That's all they had on staff there. So it was myself and another intern, and the other intern just stopped showing up. But I think I did enough, though, in the meanwhile, as a 22 year old volunteer intern, okay, not getting paid a dime. In the first week, I tried to get around and meet as many people as I could, talk with as many people as I could. That was up in administration, that was a secretary out front, that was the ATs, that was the sport coaches that were walking through or working out on their own, that was the athletes, okay? To be able to go from an intern to their interim head strength coach at 22 years of age. It's not me, you know, hyping myself up, but I did certain things on the way who I think that helped play that role to allow me to be that person. So it took me into uncharted territory though, because again, I had one internship at Weber, I'm sure it was a full year. I had a summer internship, but I was never put in a position to be an authoritative figure larger than just one team or a couple of athletes. To a certain extent, you say I was underqualified. Sure, I had my CSCS at the time, okay, but I never had that major experience. I was never working with uh, you know, admin to a certain extent. So you can say I was underqualified as well. But like I just mentioned though, the connections and interactions I think is the part that really kind of set me up for this opportunity, right? I had to weigh out the opportunity and try to maximize my time I spent during that first week. I didn't know that would happen. I would have worked for free. I didn't tell Glenn Bricky that when I met down and sat down with him at the end of the first week. And they're like, yeah, you know what, we'll keep you on, we'll pay the salary. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's great. Because I would have sat there and been like, yeah, I'll do it for free. <laughs> but what I did though is I treated it like on my own, like it was my own. So as you see here, uh, it's in a good picture. I took it off the internet and couldn't find it on my phone. We switched phones, but each of these plates have a Stetson had his logo on it. Each of the dumbbells have the same thing. Uh, not decent facility. But what I did though, each night that first week, as soon as day two happened, I realized there's an opportunity in front of me that something may happen. I may be able to try to get a job here because I knew there's a moving and shaking going on. And I probably would have done that either way, but I walked through every night. Before I left there, and I turned the letters up, 
on at least the outside plate. And I did the same thing with my dumbbells. I turned them up. So it read vertical, or read you know, correctly horizontally. It wasn't turned upside down or anything. It read horizontally, numbers facing up. Okay, when it looked presentable, and people that walk through will probably like, oh, this place looks like it's put together. You know, because I wanted to treat it like it was my own. And I think that's the part of me that kind of allowed me the opportunity to be where I was. I didn't go in there saying, I'm just a volunteer intern, trying to get my hours from my SCCC, and I'm just gonna move on and find a new job. No, I was. I want to be invested in that time and place where my feet are at. I want to be invested with where I'm at rather than looking for the next gig or looking for the next place to go in and water the grass somewhere, right? We always talk about it being greener on the other side of the fence. No, it's greener where you water it. Water the grass where you're at and be where your feet are at. So like I mentioned before there, I had the opportunity to gain the assistant salary, kind of nice thing. They didn't have to do that for me. Uh, but at 20 years of age, I feel like I did a decent enough job with those things, okay? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm not gonna leave. Yeah, you pay me that, I'm gonna stay for as long as I need to. Uh, but eventually what happened though, another opportunity came in front of me, okay? So now they hire a head strength coach. I'm um, put with two opportunities now. I can stay in interview, okay, for the assistant position at Stetson. The, the new head strength coach said, yeah, we'll evaluate who we have. So that's me, okay? Or Coach Raz says, hey, come back to Weber, you can be the full-time assistant with me, okay? And I had to weigh out the following things, you know? If I were to interview for Stetson, he wasn't gonna be there for another two weeks. Coach Raz says by the end of the week, hey, let me know. Because if not, I'm bringing on Coach Wallace, all right? <laughs> but those were the things that were presented to me. And uh, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna just go with this. I gained a lot of mentorship and abilities. I learned a lot of things from Coach Raz. I'm gonna be able to grow to be a better coach because of my time at Weber. And I, without a doubt, I think it's been another great move for me to, again, but I had to, I had to weigh out the opportunities that were in front of me. It wasn't gonna be, you know, hand it to me at Stetson, but I had to be able to weigh the opportunities out to find out what would be good for me. So here we go again. Come back to Weber. All right, it's time for a second time. And now I put this up here because, again, softball now. So I worked with beach volleyball, bowling, and softball, and football before. So now I'm working with football as an assistant. And I throw an asterisk up here because, again, this time around, I think I'm the only person at the NAIA level, definitely, but at the collegiate level that's working with one team, getting paid a full-time assistant salary. And I'm going to charge one team only on team softball. So eventually, though, what was uh, nice about it, though, I was going to put a lot of time and effort into that team. Right? I didn't have a lot of other responsibilities. This is actually a picture from uh, a girl, Brandy Hayes, and hit a home run during the NAI World Series. Uh, we finished like six or eight, something like that. But, um, but kind of unique thing. So if you ever have the opportunity to work with just one team and get very sport specific, that's an awesome thing. Especially if you learn to love the sport or you play the sport, it's the best thing ever. You just kind of get lost sometimes though. So, you know, take it easy and don't just dive in feet first and, and get lost and everything because you can spend a lot of time spinning your wheels and losing your, your family, your friends, and things like that. So, but a really awesome opportunity for me. So during my second time here, you see our staff in that year, Coach Raz got the end representing. Uh, the picture was barely big enough to fit everybody in. There's 12 coaches there. Uh, Coach Wallace right there for you Florida Southern people, okay? I think he looks just like Dr. Allen, so he's definitely <laughs> on that, so. Uh, but what I learned during my second time here, though, well, I learned how to manage, okay? 12 strength coaches, uh, Coach Raz, myself, and Coach Wallace, with three upper level strength coaches. So we had basically nine intern assistants and a few we were working under eight of us. So a lot of moving parts and pieces and having to manage their personalities, their programs, things like that. Uh, so I learned a lot of things there. I learned how to do more than a title, okay? More than just a strength coach. Here at a small school, we have a small departments everywhere, right? If you're the maintenance and, and uh, housekeeping people, there's not a lot of them. So I'm not going and saying, why am I away from clean? No, we're gonna clean the weight from ourselves. We're gonna do the small things and pitch in however we can. Because at the end of the day though, what we're gonna get back to the community and back to the college is only gonna help us out in the long run. Those relationships we build across campus, whether academically or somewhere else, those types of things are gonna help us out in the long run. So we're not gonna be just a strength coach and sit in our, uh, sit in our, our tunnel down there, or sit in our office and not get out of there and help anybody else out. I also learned how to delegate. A uh, huge thing there. If you never delegate anything, you can be a double-edged sword. You can delegate something out, it can be done wrong, piss you off, make your time 10 times worse, or you can do it the other way, which is kind of, you know, being able to understand, hey, if I go to that, I need something done, okay, I need to go explain to somebody how I need it done, I need to follow up with them if it's done right or wrong, and address those needs. Because a lot of times in the strength coach, it's all about the ego. I gotta do it. 
And you know, if you want something done right, what do you do? You do it yourself, okay? And I, I had that mindset, but I learned eventually, slowly, that I needed to have, incorporate, and empower other people along the way. And I also learned about our hiring process. Our hiring process here is in depth, and very lengthy at that. Every single coach that's come in here can attest to that. Um, we don't just hire anybody off a whim. Uh, we make them jump through and over a lot of hurdles and hoops uh, to get here. And so that's why I think it weeds out a lot of people in the process. So if you have a staff and you do a lot of hiring, whether again it's in strength and conditioning or it's in something else, uh, I think your hiring process is ultimately gonna help you uh, hopefully alleviate some of the headaches you may face, even if it's, um, depending on who you're hiring, even if it's not in strength and conditioning, right? No matter where you're at, from uh, public, or excuse me, the private sector, or through some type of other avenue of work, you know, you're hiring people to come in, well, you, hopefully you have a good process to eliminate those people that are not the case or not the fit for you as they, uh, as they apply. So now I've been a Weber for a little bit, I had another opportunity now, so I'm gonna leave, and I'm gonna go to Lawrence, maybe. So I had to weigh out those things, the pros and cons of those. I had the opportunity to stay here, Started my master's program, which I haven't started yet. I get hardened on the successes that we've already had over time. Um, but I didn't see a room to grow. Coach Rams was already here for, this is now, I guess year seven probably. He was just hitting the ground running with our mentorship program. It was just not picking up speed. We just had 12 coaches come through. I'm like, oh man, I need to go somewhere else so I can do some more things right here because uh, he had a hard time with Doug being as well. Um, so I didn't see a big opportunity there. And then I saw this opportunity at D3 School, Wisconsin, uh, I could go challenge myself. I could be the solo guy. Uh, I could really, you know, get to be my own own department. There'd be nobody telling me how to do things per se, other than the AD making sure I was doing things appropriately. Uh, but that was basically it. So what would I do? I jump ship and I take my butt to Appleton, Wisconsin. And wow, that was quite the experience. <laughs> you have time to go to if you take a Florida boy and take him to Wisconsin, you're like, oh, it was okay. It was okay at best. Don't let Mark or Drew tell you otherwise, because um, the nine months of winter up there is not a joke, so it's a couple, a couple months are nice. But, uh, so anyways, I went to Lawrence University. Had a nice little weight room there I was able to utilize. Uh, was one point a swim, uh, swim pool, then it was a wrestling room, and then it was a batting cage. And so my flooring here, this green stuff, the actual turf looking stuff, is actually the flooring they have for the batting cages. They had a couple platforms they put in. Uh, but it was very different than what I was used to, right? The weight room you saw in there today is the same weight room I had when I was here the first time around. The only thing that changed was a little bit of paint on the wall. So I had 16 racks to work with, I had all the space, and then I got to this thing, I'm like, well, I have to use the platforms to lift on, and we cut out little holes or little spots there in the squat racks to go squat on, because the turf here is a little spongy, you know? I'm like, damn, I still got to play, I should call him, right? So, uh, but anyway, so that's what I had to work with. Uh, 17 teams overall, when you include all the sports there, men's and women's. Um, so again, too, being able to be exposed, though, to these teams and work with these teams, ultimately gonna help me out in the long run. Whether later on in my career, when I try to jump down a different hole, if it's like, let's go sports specific, let's try to go for this one-time thing and make it big, like a D1 type thing or like professional. Um, but I've been exposed and working with all these teams in some capacity. Uh, and what you'll learn, when you're at a D3 school working a solo job, there's uh, a lot of things. But the first one is uh, a very nostalgic photo. So this photo is actually taken in the weight room over there. This is with the baseball team from Lawrence, and this is actually me. When we came down to spring break, I was able to lift the guys here at, on campus. Uh, so again, I've made a decent enough connections along the way to say, hey, can I bring my baseball team by? We're trying to lift, we're on spring break. And Raz like, yeah, bring by. So, It'll be a nice little thing for us, but uh, kind of a unique photo that would ultimately uh, kind of show my transition back here just a short year after. Um, but what I learned is I learned that burning the candles at both ends, okay? And there had to be a candle because up in Wisconsin, it's 4.45 in the afternoon in the wintertime, and it's pitch black, midnight dark. And I'm like, what in the world? Where is the sun? Where is something? But uh, it was late nights, early mornings. Uh, so I learned how to actually do that and through a full nine months of the actual academic year. Uh, that they have up there uh, was actually pretty tough. The time management skills, okay? So just like that, and like I said before, when you spend a lot of time somewhere, you're gonna be exposed and you're gonna have to learn how to manage time. Uh, whether it's with programming, which is a huge thing for me, because again, 17 teams, how am I gonna program for each of those teams? Well, I'm gonna probably put the same program or something similar for men's and women's basketball, or something similar for baseball and softball, with the exception of maybe a baseball pitcher. Uh, but you learn how to make those things happen and manage your time more effectively. I had to be resourceful with what I had. 
I showed you the weight room. Uh, it's not the best thing ever. It wasn't the worst thing ever. But I learned how to manage my time, and I learned how to be resourceful with the equipment I had. And it meant for me sometimes going across campus to work a lift or swim and dive because I couldn't make it over, or with fencing or something like that. So I had to be resourceful with the equipment I was exposed to and the things I had. And then uh, the last one here, if you want a challenge, if any of you guys want a challenge, go solo. Because there's nothing more that will expose you uh, to a little bit of the difficulty and a little bit of uh, unsureness about yourself, and you'll learn a lot about yourself if you find yourself in solo gig. And the last one there, too, is also going to be treat it like you're going to be there for 10 years. Um, just like we talked about before of treating it like it's your own, treat each opportunity like you're going to be there for 10 years. Now, for me, at Lawrence, it's only 10 months, okay? But I stepped in right away and I said, no, we're not going to have a uh, 4.30 afternoon session where every single athlete comes in, which is what they had before. I'm gonna treat each of those college athletes, which is what they were, like a college athlete. You're gonna come in with your sports team and we're gonna train you for about an hour or whatever I was allotted, 45 minutes to an hour, and I'm gonna train each of those teams just like that. Now for my longevity, was it the smartest thing ever? Maybe not, but I got in thinking, you know what? I'm not gonna have, you know what, my way through this. We're gonna do it the right way. And so that's why I got in there, I'm like, I'm gonna do this thing right, I'm gonna set this up for success, and I tried to build upon it with a, a, to the best extent I could while I was there. But just like before, opportunities come knocking, so I had the opportunity to stay at Lawrence and come back to Florida. During my time, actually, I'll, I'll say this, because when I was at Lawrence, it was great, I kind of found out real quick, though, that uh, my time there, my longevity, based upon my uh, life work, or work-life balance, was not very good. Um, so, needless to say, I was coming back to Florida though for a different job, not coming here actually, so it was kind of unique. Uh, I accepted a job somewhere else, I was going to come back, and they had to wait about two weeks, so the paperwork had cleared. And at the same time, Raz says, hey, uh, I got a job for you, you want to come back? I'm like, well, you know what, I got another job, it looks a little better on the resume, it's an assistant position, it's closer to home, uh, but he goes, oh yeah, well I need to know by uh, one more week or else I'm going to call Clay Allen up, who's now in Sornex. Uh, and I'm gonna give him the job. I said, okay, all right, all right. Let me, let me weigh these things out, and I'll get back with you. So ultimately, though, I ended up coming back to Weber again. And like I mentioned before, there's some different things I had to weigh out. I had to weigh out whether see, I was gonna see it through before I just started at Lawrence. Yeah, I wanted to. I really wanted to really bad. And I told him earlier today I was gonna be like a two or three year commitment. But there's certain times that I find out during my during those first couple months I was at Lawrence. I'm like, wow, I'm 22 hours from home. Uh, I love the sunshine. You probably can't tell right now. Summer's coming around the corner, but uh, and there was not a lot of that. It was really cold. Uh, I went to school in Indiana. I'm like, ah, I can do the Midwest, you know. Uh, six hours north, those inches of snow in Indiana turned into feet of snow in Wisconsin. And those uh, single digits you had in Indiana, like once or twice, you had uh, like weeks of those in Wisconsin. So I'm like, yeah, all right. So the environmental factors were like, yeah, we'll go back to Florida. Uh, but then the livelihood too. So like I mentioned before as well, the livelihood was the big thing. So many times I think in this field, we neglect ourselves as coaches or as people and try to put our profession before ourselves or our family. And I was not gonna do that. I could have worked my butt off and stayed there and hated life for the next two or three years and still be there today. Uh, but that wasn't gonna happen because I had the opportunity in front of me and I had to weigh those things out. So we come back now. This is gonna be a kind of wrap up here as we get there. So third time's a charm. Okay, now we're back. Now we're rolling, okay? Because now we're rocking and rolling. All right, shout out to Coach Steven Ferson over here. All right, over there at Southeastern now. Congrats to him. Join, hopefully. Uh, but teams I work with now, Weber, third time around, softball and football. Uh, again, still back to those two sports. Um, what do I do on a daily basis? Well, I oversee the design invitation for all 21 sports here. Uh, basically, what I do is I run football and softball. I still oversee and make sure that our, we have proper implementation with our other sports uh, that our GAs and assistants run. Um, so it's kind of a unique thing to me to get back into my management style and the things I've learned along the way of being a better manager. Um, I'm also responsible for the NSCA recognized staff mentorship uh, that we do for our six staff members. Um, so we have seven on staff right now, and we have six of them that go through. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, a couple people dropped off Taylor. All right, but anyways, so responsible for that. So we make sure that's up to par. So we go through our mentorship process. Uh, it's very involved, very in depth. And it's an exciting time for me to be able to grow because my coaches are constantly challenging me. And just like I have to be on my toes, uh, I ask them to be on their toes for my, my challenges. I have to be the same way when they come to challenge me too. So, uh, But what it looks like now, so this was the current staff we started out with this year. 
Let's see. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He left yesterday. He's done in the summer. So what I've learned, though, is that there's a lot of turnover, and you have to be able to understand and be able to uh, hire properly, like I mentioned before. Okay? You have to be able to manage all these people, all right? and you have to be able to integrate them as well. So I've learned to be an effective leader along the way. When I was here the first time around with Coach Wallace and, as an assistant, Coach Raz was the, the medium guy. He was the mediator. He was the good cop. Coach Wallace and I were the bad cops, and we could be that way, and I had no problem. I loved being that guy. But then when I came back in the position I'm in right now, I can't be that guy because I have these people to my left and right that are looking up to me for a, a leader uh, position. And if I be demeaning to one person because I did something wrong, how's it gonna treat the other staff and how's it gonna make them react? And so at, at a young age still, somewhat of a young age, it allows me to understand that there's some, some challenges I need to either take on or not take on and how to be a more effective leader with an entire staff. I capitalize on my opportunities I was faced with on a daily and weekly basis, as well as on my journey through strength and conditioning. Like I mentioned too before, the integration of the personalities, right? You have all these people coming in here from across the country, across the states, the different backgrounds, they had different experiences, different internships. How do I integrate those personalities? We do a lot of staff mentoring, okay? And one of the things we also do here too, is we have who am I's, okay? Coach Schultz just got here this past week. He was exposed to those things, okay? We talk about things in who am I's that nobody talks about. You're not supposed to talk about, all right? You know, your religious views. I just got kind of strange, right? Your political views. We really don't want to go there, all right? But your upbringing, what challenges do you have that make you different? What things have you struggled with? Those types of things help break down walls and start to mesh together a large staff, okay? And then along the journey, too, I've understood my limits. There are limits, and I've met those head on. Right now, I'm a full-time student. I'm a head strength coach. Uh, working with a lot of our teams, doing a little PT work on the side, got a lot of things moving. And I've learned that I can handle those things. When I was at Lawrence and had all those 17 teams, was doing the 5.30 to sometimes 7 or 8 o'clock at night, and doing it all over again, and still going to games on the weekends, that was towards my limit. Right now, I'm kind of okay, all right? But you definitely learn about your limits and where you can push and where you can't. Last quote here uh, by John Maxwell, one of the leadership gurus. If you haven't looked up anything from him, I would highly encourage you to. Uh, we go through some of his stuff with our staff, and I think this is the case. Anything worthwhile is uphill. You're not gonna fall into something that's great by just going through the motions. You're gonna have to climb, and you're gonna have some valleys and some peaks, but you're gonna have to climb up that hill to get something that's worthwhile. So just like what I do is for my staff. There's also a thing I do too, and that's for these three. So my mom, my sister, and my current girlfriend. Um, <laughs> but my sister's back in the back, so. Um, but no, it puts things into perspective that you have to have a support system. Just like the support system around me, and while I try to bust my tail for these guys around me, I do the same thing for those three. So we're, uh, we're almost to the final things here. Financial maximization, we'll go through this kind of quick. So we talk about strength coaches, we talk about budgeting and the importance of money right earlier on, okay? You have to be able to budget things out. Let's get real about it, okay? If you're not making a lot of money, live within your means, okay? Don't be spending a lot of stuff. And if you can't make it happen, find some type of supplemental income. We all have experiences and we're all in the profession. Well, we know a little bit about health. We may be a strength coach or maybe whatever we are, okay? Can you also maybe do some PT work on the side? Possibly. That's currently what we do right now, some of us do, to make a little bit of strong income and it makes his life a little bit easier, okay? Uh, Brent Rizzoni, how many strength coaches again do you know that actually own a house? Those are in the collegiate field at least. High school made it probably a little better, but at the collegiate level, it's not very many probably. You're ever moving, ever changing, going from one position to the next. And the last one is kind of another cool joke too. Uh, maybe you can marry up, you know, because again too, similar to that, there's not very many strength coaches out there though that haven't married up to some aspect. A lot of strength coaches find people with their significant other that are, are usually a little well better off than they are. Um, because I think again too, it goes back to the financial thing, right? So it may be an option for you. 
But let's tie it all together though, so now we're maximizing our time in the field. Okay, Coach Steve Rassel pictured, again, big mentor of mine, started a lot of things here. The interaction and engagement, okay? I think you have to have that. You have to be able to do things in the field similar to this. And I'm not saying the, because I didn't start this out. It's not me, okay? Coach Rass started this. I helped along the way in some aspect, okay? But doing things to get back to those in the field, all right? Putting the ego down. The engagement part is probably part of it. So many times in strength and conditioning, you go to the collegiate level especially, there's an ego. I don't want to tell you what I'm doing with my athletes because I don't want you to steal it, but yet there's no real correlation back to the actual successes of the one team to the next. So we're just going to play like a big chess game where we're like, yeah, I'm not going to tell you anything because I don't want you to take it. Put down the ego. What works for me may not work for Coach Mark or Coach Josh or somebody else. Share the experiences. Like I've done today, I've thought some good things that I've, I've learned along the way. Hopefully you take something from that. We have to go share experiences. Mentor. Okay? The mentoring ability or the ability to mentor is huge. And there's a big asterisk next to this. Because I absolutely think we're doing a terrible job in the field. And I know I'm only 26, but I think we're doing a terrible job in the field of mentoring. Like I mentioned before, when you have a 20 interns that come in and stand there, and it's somewhat the same conversation I've had with many coaches on our staff, there's people that go to these different places, most of them are major Division I schools, and they'll go in and be an intern. Okay? And you'll go in, you'll set up, uh, tell me the other day, right? Yes, they have 20 of us, okay? Took two of us to do the job. 18 of us just stand there for another hour. Because all they have to do is tear down and set up and do the small rudimentary task they don't want to do. No, this isn't a tattoo apprenticeship. Don't just let them sit there and watch for a whole nine months or six months. Give them the opportunity to grow. Give them the opportunity and, and let them learn, okay? Allow them to coach. That's one of the biggest things that my mentor gave me, Coach Major Harrison, was allowing me to coach. He was right there watching, gave me feedback, critiques, but he mentored me and just say, you gotta sit there and watch. You'll learn something someday. And then get back to it again. Whether it's speaking, whether it's involvement around people around you, uh, get involved with certain things um, to that level and get back to, the, to what we have going on. Growth only occurs in a state of discomfort. We talked about this with our staff last week, uh, kind of a unique video. Uh, I think it's one of the uh, TEDx videos by Bill Extra on there. And I think it's uh, fairly accurate too. Okay, it's only gonna, growth is only gonna occur in that state of discomfort. So get outside the comfort zone. If it's giving back, get outside of it, okay? And decide to be able to be a bigger influence on the profession than just what you are currently. So our take home points, we're gonna finish up pretty quick. Know why you're in the profession. The why is the important part, okay? Because again, if you're not in it, you don't know why you're in it, you may struggle to find that, that those peaks or those good times in the profession. So know why you're in it. Helping others for me is that case. It's not about me. I want to be able to help people and bring people along the way, okay? So don't make it an ego thing. Maximization, you gotta be able to maximize the time. We've all seen this, this picture properly, right? I hope you see in the back, the tiny gains. 1% better, 1% worse every single day up to the 365th power. You're gonna see a major change between those two numbers, right? Choose to be better every day. Choose to be better every day. Understand the pros and cons associated with each position. Again, this can be even just in life. Take it away from strength and conditioning. Understand why you're taking a job, why you're applying for a job, well, the pros and cons like I did, okay, like I showed that I've done, because a lot of times, too, in this profession, you're gonna see a job pop up, and like, oh, that's me, I'm going there, I'm going to get that job, because you like the logo, or you like the name, or whatever it may be, okay, but be able to weigh things out, and understand why it's a good position for you or not, why it's a good fit or not. And lastly, you gotta have a good support system, so again, so like I mentioned prior, uh, with my, my, my three women in my life, uh, girlfriend here and also my family. So I really wouldn't be where I am today uh, without them. Again, there's, there's struggles on the way, financially, mentally, emotionally, uh, different things through the strength and conditioning, uh, but being able to understand and have those people around me has been a huge help to my career. Uh, and I think lastly too, as well as I finish up, um, I think that it's probably beneficial for you to find somebody um, that is a significant other that is going to be understanding of a coach, okay? Because there's many times that you would spend time away, if you're at games, matches, whatever it is, you're traveling, you have early morning workouts, whatever it may be, you need to find somebody that's gonna understand that. Because if you don't, I think that's probably one of the main reasons why people get out of the field is because they don't have that aspect at home. With a family life, significant other, and you had a child into that too, which I don't have right now. Less than not have that, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I think it's important though to be able to give back time to the family, okay? Because that's a huge thing. I've seen many people, and I, Coach Rad, my mentor, 
has taught about that with me um, a lot of being able to understand that you have to be able to give time to the family and to those loved ones around you because we can get so lost in our profession of getting in the weight room, staying in there, training ourselves, training our athletes, and we can just forget about everything outside. And if we do that, it's going to be a short time profession because you're going to get drained out, somebody's going to leave you, and you're going to be kind of a struggle. So, last one there is tough times don't last, but tough people do. Okay, there's going to be highs and lows. A lot of great times and land jobs. I haven't been fired yet. That's what I always say too is you're going to be fired at some point. <laughs> really hoping it's not here. Uh, but you know, tough times won't last. The toughest person will though. So uh, I think that's all I got. So appreciate you guys being here today.